said, you know, the Bush family owns Pennzoil, and I, I'm a native Midwesterner, though I'm here in Tampa. I, I asked the guys to repeat that, and uh, in fact, they, they own the Carlisle Investment Group and Pennzoil, and at one time, they, they owned Carlisle Group, owned Dunkin' Donuts, which is now a French company, or at least it was, but the, the point I'm trying to make is I'd like to thank uh, Inspector Bowen for the attempt that he's conducting. I love C-SPAN. It's a very uh, fact-finding uh, television show. Uh, and uh, I don't think Americans really have a place where they can communicate. I can hear the frustration in the earlier call callers' um, attempts to communicate, and it's really sad to hear them struggle with their native language. But, uh, you know, as, as an Abraham Lincoln Republican to the last caller uh, and as a veteran, I uh, I would say how sad it is. I've yet to meet, meet an American that claims to be politically a Republican that expresses any sorrow for the loss. The uh, the money that Inspector Bowen's looking for and has found is only able to release what what he's told he can release, and 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 that's that's just the way things are done. And I'm not criticizing him for that. Uh, that 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 money, a lot of the reconstruction money, was actually to uh, soft sell the war to the American citizens. The uh, essentially, and I don't mean to be a chauvinist, the soccer mom mentality of the United States, the kinder, gentler side of our of our nature as people. That's Maybe better put, and 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 matter of fact, I would bet I'll hang up and and get the answer from Inspector Bowen. But I would imagine most of the projects actually weren't even weren't even conducted. I would also, on the behalf of my veterans, say that how sad it was that a number of the soldiers were electrocuted in showers over there because of the faulty wiring and the loss of life. I don't hear I don't ever hear Americans express loss like that. I never hear Americans say, "What about Major Scott Ritter, our senior?" senior weapons inspector, a delegate to the United Nations, who told us there were no weapons of mass destruction. And uh, like a comedian said, we, we know that they, they have the, uh, don't have the weapons of mass destruction because we hold the receipts. So war is for profit. I'm a big fan of Smedley Butler. I protest in this war, and I thank you, Inspector Bowen, for the work you do. Could you comment on the uh, projects that actually didn't get done? Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, and, and the credit for the work done by my office goes to the auditors, investigators, and inspectors who faithfully carried out the very challenging mission, Oversight Under Fire in Iraq over the last nine years. Uh, we identified the challenge with regard to projects, and, and your, your point is very well taken. So many of them actually weren't finished when it came to transferring them to Iraqi control. And when the United States went to transfer them and the Iraqis reviewed them, two things happen. Sometimes they looked at the project and said, hey, this was something we never wanted. We refused to accept it. Or second, they said, hey, this project's not finished. You need to fund its completion. And we didn't in, in most cases. And in, that, in, in those instances, the Iraqis just said no, and so they were unilaterally transferred. Hundreds and hundreds of projects, simply a piece of paper signed, handed the Iraqis and said, it's yours. That's waste, clearly. And, and, it, and it also uh, foreshortens the, 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 the ultimate mission uh, of all this reconstruction money, which, which is to improve Iraq, strengthen its democracy, and, and build goodwill. Uh, when, when you don't consult properly, and when you don't transfer assets effectively, and you don't ensure their sustainment, uh, the program breaks down. Mr. Bowen, what happens next? This is your final report. We're talking about this report called Learning from Iraq. Who will monitor efforts from here on out? Will that be done internally in Iraq? Will there be any kind of U.S. representative uh, looking to see how American investments pay off over the long term? The Department of State Inspector General will have oversight of the economic support fund money that will continue to be spent in Iraq, and there are still substantial amounts uh, on the table appropriated yet to be expended. The Department of Defense Inspector General and, and also the U U.S. Agency for International Development Inspector General, which, which has, by the way, done, a, I think, a very excellent job over the last nine years alongside us in Iraq, uh, will also play important roles uh, in, in monitoring that, that money. What happens to your office? We continue uh, to carry out the 60-plus cases that we have ongoing. We expect to get at least 20 more convictions from them added to our, the 82 we have so far and to recover hundred million dollars more. We have some major cases close to settlement uh, added, which will add to the 200 million roughly that we've already recovered. And, and we will close our doors on September 30th this year. Scott's our next caller, Waiting River, New York, on the independent line. Hi, Scott. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I would just like to know why our president uh, hasn't made efforts to uh, reclaim uh, our expenditures in Iraq. And if he hasn't, I would like to know why. Uh, 
what efforts are are being done to uh, to uh, move ahead with uh, collecting our expenditures? Now, this is an oil rich nation, and I don't understand why uh, <clears throat> we're not able to collect any money. All we all, the result of this war was a big bill. That's all we got out of it. And I'm not suggesting, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not suggesting to fight a war for oil because the, uh, a lot of blood has been spilled. But why not be paid for a war that uh, that's fought for uh, other reasons besides oil? Okay, thanks, Scott. Stuart okay. Bowen. Well, Scott, we have, through our audits, recovered uh, over $640 million from the program. But your larger question, why, why isn't the United States seeking recovery of the billions from Iraq? The program wasn't structured that way. It wasn't structured as a loan program. It was structured effectively as a grant program. There, there was no obligation on the part of the Iraqis to pay back any of that money. Our caller talked about the president, and he wanted to see the president make more of an effort to, to recoup money. Uh, did anything change in your office with the changeover? Of Mr. President, a few weeks ago, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, initiated an unexplainable uh, order uh, to take action to reduce the population of detained illegal aliens. And they said it was for budgetary reasons. And I quote a spokesman for ICE who said the decision was made because fiscal uncertainty remains over the continuing resolution and possible sequestration. Well. We've had fiscal uncertainty for now for four years. And, uh, uh, but the decision to release these detainees was made before the sequestration even took place. And the procedures put in place under the continuing resolution and the resources for covering the costs of detaining these illegal immigrants until they could be brought to trial and sent back home uh, the funds for that were put in place by the, by the uh, funding that we provided for them in September running through the end of this month or to March 27th. And so a lot of questions were raised that I think needed be, to be answered because there was a furor over this idea of why are we releasing and putting back out on the streets in America, a lot of this was in Arizona, and why are we putting these people back out on the streets? Um, when it, the, the law didn't require it, uh, the resources were there to keep them there. Um, they were put out before the sequestration, sequestration even took place, or the across the board cuts even took place. And I just wanted to get some answers. And so I wrote Secretary Napolitano a letter asking her um, to provide answers to a series of questions, which I'll, I'll uh, state in just a moment. Uh, and had the answer to me in my office by Friday, March 8th. Well, returned today um, to find that that answer was not there. I could give the secretary the benefit of the doubt, saying uh, it's, it's in the mail. Uh, we know that uh, that doesn't always guarantee next day delivery. Nevertheless, uh, I think the American people, and particularly those impacted, those communities impacted by these illegal immigrants, uh, not knowing who they are, uh, not knowing why they're released, not knowing whether we can uh, bring them back to stand uh, before a judge, uh, plead their case, uh, or be processed for return to where they came from, uh, but roaming the streets. So alarms of the law enforcement officials in these communities are, are up in arms, and saying they don't know who these people are, they don't know whether they're criminals, they don't know whether they're uh, ever going to be able to, uh, to, to bring them back into uh, the ICE system uh, and be detained and ready for uh, processing. And so uh, uh, that is why I asked the Secretary to uh, respond to my letter. Now, subsequent to that, officials at ICE uh, have denied recent press reports regarding plans to release even more detained illegal immigrants. But just last Tuesday, an internal ICE document obtained by the House Judiciary Committee revealed a plan of ICE to continue reducing detention center populations each week while the sequestration was in place. And that document shows one scenario where the number of illegal immigrants 
in custody could be re reduced by more than 1,000 a week between February 15th and March 31st. The initial reports were that was just a couple hundred. I think 300 was the, the uh, number given, only to find out that it was more than 1,000. And now we find out that it may be more than 1,000 each week for about a six or seven week period of time. So what we're trying to do is get the facts here and get an explanation of what has happened, uh, why it took place in the manner that it did, uh, what's the administration's plan for going forward with this. Uh, I'm doing this because as ranking member on the Appropriations Committee for Homeland Security, uh, I'm getting all kinds of questions from people, not just my colleagues, but uh, others across the country basically saying, what's going on here? Uh, and I would like to be able to respond to those questions with answers or have the department respond. As the head of the department, the Secretary Napolitano needs to provide information on who made this decision, why this decision was made, uh, why was it made before the sequestration even took effect, why was the, the number uh, released of around 300 when it was well over 1,000, and a whole number of, of other uh, questions. Thus, uh, release of this detained information is, uh, and denial of that uh, has the potential to put these communities at risk, which they already are, and sends a message to those who come here and break the law as illegal immigrants that our government's not serious. Uh, I'm sure word is spreading through Mexico and other ports of entry for illegal immigrants that, uh, well, don't worry, you may get picked up, you may get put in a detention center, they'll provide bed and food and so forth and so on, but they're releasing a thousand a week and I can just see the traffickers now pitching this to tens of hundreds or thousands of people, taking their money, getting them across the border, breaching the fence or tunneling under the fence or climbing over the fence um, or any of the number of other ways that they are bringing illegals into this country. And I spent three days down on the border and it's... Uh, while we we're making some strides, we've got a long way to go to stop this illegal immigration. Uh, so we, we need clarification and we need an explanation of, of what is happening here. Let me just uh, state uh, what's some of the questions that I've raised uh, to the secretary and why we need this uh, information. Why did the federal government release detained illegal immigrants one week before the sequester took effect and blame it on budget cuts? when those cuts had not even yet gone in place? Why didn't ICE take the proper steps necessary to manage its resources efficiently across the various programs? As I said earlier, the Congress itself provided them with adequate resources to maintain a level of 34,000 illegal detainees um, uh, and not go below, they did not need to go below that number because they had the resources to pay for that. Um, we had provided that by law and they were required by law to do that. What triggered ICE to instruct field offices to reduce the detainee population a week before the sequester hit? How many illegal immigrants were released during that time? Exactly how many of these individuals were released solely due to budget reasons? How many of the released individuals, if any, were designated as criminal? Law enforcement people obviously have to know that. Have instructions been given to field offices to reduce the intake and arrests of illegal aliens into detention? And these are just some of the many questions that I asked Secretary Napolitano because I think the Congress and the American people deserve answers to these questions. As the head of the department, Secretary Napolitano has the ultimate responsibility to oversee the decisions and management of agency resources. She said this decision was made at a level below her. Uh, we hear a lot of that from administration officials. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Ultimately, that's why they rise to the position of secretary, is that is, they're the ones that ultimately oversee the program and need to take responsibility, or at least need to answer a question posed by a member of the Senate as to why they did what they did and how we're going to fix this. So failing to respond to the Congress and to our requests, the failure to provide the American people with more information behind this decision is just simply not something we should accept. And I will keep pressing for these answers. Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll.
Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. Senator from West Virginia. I ask the quorum call be dispensed with and be able to speak as if in morning business for up to 10 minutes. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I rise today to bring attention to a recent decision by the Department of Defense to authorize a new military decoration, the Distinguished Warfare Medal, as a way to recognize the contribution of silent warriors, such as drone pilots and cyber warriors. I have absolutely no objection to the creation of the Distinguished Warfare Medal. Every day, our silent warriors use modern warfare technology in ways that have had an extraordinary impact on today's battlefield, saving the lives of countless American servicemen and women and enhancing the national security of our country. However, Mr. President, I adamantly oppose the decision by the Defense Department to elevate the Distinguished Warfare Medal above the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart, which are awarded for acts of valor and heroism on the battlefield and above the Soldier's Medal, which is given for acts of gallantry beyond the battlefield. Mr. President, I believe that medals earned in combat or in other life-threatening conditions should maintain their precedence above non-combat awards. Placing the Distinguished Warfare Medal above the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart diminishes the significance of such awards earned by risking one's life in direct combat or through acts of heroism. I'm not alone in my opposition to the precedence of the Defense Department plans to give the Distinguished Warfare Medal. A bipartisan group of 21 other senators, our colleagues, has joined me in a letter to the Defense Secretary Hagel urging him to reconsider the Department's decision. The Veterans of Foreign Wars in my state and in your state, Mr. President, has also asked Secretary Hagel to reconsider. And while the Secretary has told the VFW that he is satisfied with the criteria and placement of the Distinguished Warfare Medal, I believe that we can still make the case that combat awards and medals for gallantry should remain the military's highest honors. In his response to the VFW defending the new medal, Secretary Hagel asserts that there are numerous existing medals that may be awarded for non-valorous achievements, which are higher in precedence than the Bronze Star. That is true. There are medals such as the Legion of Merit, not directly linked to a single act of valor. But these medals recognize distinguished service, often spanning several generations of service. These awards are given for vastly different periods and, types, and different types of service. Comparing awards for lifetime achievement to the Distinguished Warfare Medal, which even Secretary Hagel's letter states, is awarded for a single, and I, repoint, I re repeat, a single extraordinary act is not an appropriate justification for its precedence above the Bronze Star and Purple Heart. Veterans groups are understandably upset. The new Distinguished Warfare Medal appears to be a wartime medal based on a single event that trumps acts of valor on the field of battle. In this dispute, I think it is instructive to consider why the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart were created. The Bronze Star was conceived by Colonel Russell Red Reader in 1943. At the time, he and other military officers felt there was a need for a ground combat medal equivalent to the Air Medal, which was awarded for meritorious achievement to our pilots and flight crews. In fact, originally, the award that became the Bronze Star was proposed, was proposed as the Ground Medal. The award was created to boost morale of American ground forces during World War II. As General George C. Marshall explained to President Roosevelt in a letter, the fact that the ground troops, infantry in particular, lead miserable lives of extreme discomfort and are the ones, and are the ones, most close in personal combat with the enemy, makes the maintenance of their morale of great importance. The award of the Air Medal has had an adverse reaction on the ground troops, particularly in infantry riflemen who are suffering the heaviest losses air or in ground, in the Army, and enduring some of our greatest hardships. The Purple Heart, of course, is one of our country's oldest military decorations, originally instituted by George Washington, then the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army in 1782, to reward troops for what he called unusual gallantry, an extraordinary fidelity and essential service. The Purple Heart was revived as a military decoration in 1932, on the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birthday. 
And, he, and in 1985, by an act of Congress, it was, it was given its current precedence just below the Bronze Star and directly above the Meritorious Service Medals, a clear recognition of the special valor of those who receive it. Mr. President, I recognize that military awards should be updated as the tactics of warfare change. Drones and cyber warfare play a role in the defense of this great country. And there is no question that each member of our military plays a crucial role in protecting our nation and every American. But I've listened to West Virginia veterans and agree with them. Our brave service members who face life and death situations deserve the most distinguished medals the United States military awards. Again, I support the Distinguished Warfare Medal. I want to make no mistake about that, but I do not believe it should be given higher precedence than awards for those who have faced the enemy on the battlefield. Awards earned for heroism, patriotism, and a willingness to make the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we all enjoy every day should not be ranked below a medal earned in relative safety. I agree wholeheartedly with veterans who have expressed their concerns about the precedence the Defense Department intends to give the Distinguished Warfare Medal. I share their belief that combat awards are sacred, reflecting the special bravery of Americans who are willing to sacrifice all for their country as well as their brothers and sisters in arms. And I join them in urging the Defense Department to preserve the legacy of these sacred awards by leaving their precedence undisturbed. Mr. President, I thank Secretary Hagel for his courageous military service to our country. Through his combat experience in Vietnam, he knows all too well the clash and the heat of battle. And he shares a special bond with generations of Americans, from Concord to Kabul, who have risked their lives in defense of this great country, many of whom have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. I hope for that reason that he reconsiders the precedence of the Distinguished Warfare Medal and agrees that combat awards should remain our military's highest honors. Mr. President, thank you. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, I ask consent to call the quorum be dispensed with. With that objection, so order. Mr. Uh, President, I ask that my statement on judicial nomination is being. Morning business is closed. And under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to consider the following nominations, which the clerk will report. Nominations. Richard Gary, Toronto, of Maryland, to be United States Circuit Judge for the Federal Circuit. Andrew Patrick Gordon, of Nevada, to be United States District Judge. Under the previous order, there will be 30 minutes for debate equally divided and controlled in the usual form. And Mr. President, I ask consent that the uh, time be divided in such a way that the vote will be at 5.30. Without objection, so order. Mr. President, um, I ask consent that my full statement on nominations of Richard Toronto and Andrew Gordon, both of whom I support, be included in the record is all read. Without objection. And Mr. President, I ask to... Um, speak in morning business on two other matters, but using my time under the uh, agreement. Without objection. Mr. President, last week I introduced uh, bipartisan legislation with Senator Collins to combat the straw purchasing and trafficking of firearms. We were joined by other senators from both sides of the aisle, and we've made good progress since then. Last Thursday, a few days after I introduced the legislation, the Senate Judiciary Committee voted for our bill as an amendment to the Stop Illegal Trafficking in Firearms Act, S-54. This is the first legislative vote of measures related to gun violence, either the Senate or the House, since the Newtown tragedy. Every Democratic senator on the committee voted in favor of our bill, and we were joined that support by the committee's ranking Republican Senator Grassley. And I appreciate his help again to spill out in the weeks of consultation he involved uh, he was involved with. Uh, the White House called the Judiciary Committee action an important bipartisan step that takes on the very serious problem of gun trafficking, and I agree with the White House. At the signing of the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act and Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act last Thursday, the Leahy Crapo Bill, the President called the Judiciary Committee's action on our bill a big step in real progress. He noted our bill would crack down on folks who buy guns only to turn around in front of them to dangerous criminals. And I hope to make progress on this and legislation, other bills. We have the strong support of several leading law enforcement organizations, including the Fraternal Order of Police, the FBI Agents Association, the Major Cities Chiefs Association, the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, and last week I received a letter from the NAACP supporting it. Now, Mr. President, just so senators would know, tomorrow the Judiciary Committee will continue its work on three remaining gun violence measures. Senator Schumer's proposal to expand requirements for background checks. Senator Boxer's uh, proposal to enhance the safety of our schools. And Senator Feinstein's bill to reinstitute an assault weapons ban. I'd like to have these completed by the end of this week in the Judiciary Committee. You know, last week when the President signed the Violence Against Women Act, he, in trafficking victims protection legislation, he said that we were able to pass this on a bipartisan measure because the American people spoke up. That's what happened on the VAWA bill when a group of House Republicans switched their position to support passing the Bible bill, even though they had opposed passing it last year. This was also needed in the context of gun violence legislation. Seven, the eight Republican senators on the Judiciary Committee voted against closing the loopholes in the law to combat 
straw purchasing and gun trafficking, even though virtually every law enforcement agency I've heard from in this country want us to close the loophole in the law, and we want us to stop uh, straw purchasing where people go in and legitimately buy weapons, but do it so they can then sell them to drug cartels or or uh, various other gangs, uh, criminal gangs that couldn't have bought them otherwise. Uh, the police said closing this loophole does nothing to stop uh, a legitimate gun owner from having a gun, but it can cut down on guns going to criminal syndicates. As one who served in law enforcement, I, I don't know why anyone would disagree with the police on this one. So if we're going to be able to close loopholes in our background check system, if we're going to improve school safety and more resources, include counselors and officers, if we're going to outlaw straw purchasing and gun trafficking, the American people need to speak up and be heard. If we're going to place limits on high capacity clips, uh, then it's going to be because the American people uh, demand such action. As far as I ask my full statement to be made part of the record. Without objection. And Mr. President, today I'm introducing bipartisan legislation to help promote com competition in the wireless industry and restore consumer choice. From 2006 until last year, an exemption to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act permitted cell phone users to unlock their cell phones when their contract expired, allowed them to change wireless providers. What this did, of course, was promote consumer choice. It also brought about competition in the cell phone market. But it was allowed to expire last year. Now, I've listened over the past few weeks and months, consumers have spoken clearly. They want to retain the right to transfer their cell phones between wireless providers that they so choose when their contracts expire. That makes a great deal of sense to me. And that's why I'm pleased to introduce the Unlocking Consumer Choice and Wireless Competition Act. I'm going to introduce it along with Senator Grassley, Senator Hatch, Senator Lee, and Senator Franken, who chairs the Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Privacy, Technology, and the Law. They were working closely with Chairman Goodlatte and members of the House Judiciary Committee to pass this. It would reestablish the Library of Congress rule permitting cell phone unlocking. You know, when he wrote the DMCA, when I wrote it, it was to provide consumer choices. This will bring back such consumer choice. And I ask consent to my full statement be made part of the record. Without objection. And do we have a bill to? Now, Mr. President, I ask to uh, send to the desk a bill on behalf of myself, Mr. Grassley, Mr. Frank, and Mr. Hatch, and Mr. Lee. The measure will be received and appropriately referred. I thank the chair. President, I suggest he has a quorum as the time be equally divided. Without objection. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. From Maryland. 